trusting God through the process. If you have your Bibles today and you would open them to Joshua, the sixth chapter, Joshua chapter six, we're going to read about 12 or 13 verses, verses eight through 20. Joshua chapter six, verses eight through 20. Amen. And by the way, I'm not trying to be cool or fresh or something with sunglasses today. These are prescription glasses, uh, but they go dark in the light. <laughs> so they've kind of darkened with the light uh, as we are outside, obviously, today. Amen. Joshua chapter 6, beginning at verse 8, and the word of the Lord reads today, from the King James text. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord Followed them, and the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the re reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpet. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the re-reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpet, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord only Rahab and harlot shall live she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Amen. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer a moment. Father, once again, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to this beautiful place. Lord, to share our worship time, 
our time with the Word of God with our friends who would watch by reason of the internet and Master, today there is nothing greater, there is nothing more wonderful than hearing a word from heaven that is able to feed our soul, to cause our faith to grow, to inspire, and to encourage us. Let the word of God flow like a mighty river today, O oh God, through your servant. Allow me, Lord, to deliver that which you have placed in my heart, that the people of God might benefit thereby. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, we know the story of Joshua leading the battle uh, between the people of God, Israel, and a great walled city by the name of Jericho. Amen. Many of us have heard of Jericho. We're familiar with the story of the great walls of the city coming down. And it is a wonderful story and it has many great and wonderful spiritual lessons for us today. The problem that I have is all too often I hear people, uh, and I'm speaking specifically of preachers and those that call themselves ministers of the gospel, I hear them using this story in order to create points that really are not in keeping with the spirit and the lesson of this particular story. Folks, we better be careful about how we handle the Word of God. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You can make virtually any passage of Scripture say anything you want to make it say mm -hmm. if you're careless, or for that matter, if you're integrityless. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people out there who are just careless, but then by the same token, there are many out there who have no integrity. And by that I mean they know good and well they're twisting things. They know good and well that they're turning things inside out. And they're not being truthful to the text. They're not being honest with God's Word. But this afternoon, if I've ever made a commitment to anything in my life, I have made a commitment to do everything in my power to be true to the Word of God. I don't want to be faithful to anything but the Word of God. I don't want to take a story from the Scripture and twist it and turn it in order to make it say something that people will enjoy hearing. See, that's why we don't have a lot more folks in Dallas. That's why we don't have a lot more folks in our church. Because I'm probably one of the few, especially in the LGBT affirming community, who actually preach a message that I believe comes from the Lord, and I'm not concerned about uh, trying to make a message that is going to tickle ears or please the listener. That is not my job. My job is to tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. You cannot grow, you cannot prosper in your spirit unless you are fed a healthy, steady diet of the Word of God. Now listen to me today. This story that we're looking at today of Joshua leading the people of Israel uh, at war against the city of Jericho is often used out of context and out of place to illustrate God's people going to war with various issues and in various ways. I recently saw a preacher on television actually for a moment and he had taken this passage of scripture and Tommy he had tw and this is a major 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 television evangelist big name and he had taken this scripture and he was so twisting it and turning it
to try to make it apply to something that it really had no application for. And oh, I was aggravated. If there's anything that drives me crazy, it's watching uh, someone who is supposed to be a man or woman of God take the Word of God out of context, take it and twist it to try to make it say what they want it to say. I've got news for you today, church. This passage of Scripture has nothing to do with culture wars. This passage of Scripture has nothing to do with issues. You cannot take this portion of God's Word and apply it to the fundamentalist or the evangelical war against LGBT people. You cannot take this passage of Scripture and apply it to uh, a certain people's war against abortion or other issues of this nature. No, you, you have to take this so far out of context. You have to twist it and pervert it in order to make it apply to these sort of issues. That is not what this story is dealing with. This story is dealing with people who are pursuing the will of God. Amen. If there's anything in the world that we have a problem in the church today with, it is people, I've said this so many times, that my throat is sore saying it, it is people walking after their own will, walking after their own desires, walking after their own ambitions, having their own goals and their own pursuits, and expecting God to bless them in those pursuits. It does not work that way. That is not how a child of God is supposed to walk. We don't walk and ask God to follow two steps behind us. No, sir. If you're smart, you're asking God to lead and you're following by two steps am I telling the truth amen the problem is today we've got a whole culture in the church that has developed around the false message of prosperity We've got people believing that Christians are supposed to be rich and Christians are supposed to be well-to-do and they're supposed to drive the finest cars and they're supposed to have the finest things. Folks, y'all are so far off base. That message is so far off base it isn't even funny. Look at the early church. Look at the example of the first century church. i got news for you. They had a lot of people who were in need. They had a lot of people who were on the poorer side. They had a lot of people who struggled with their everyday living. That's why they had to take collections for the saints in Jerusalem. That's why they had to, uh, uh, the word of God said in the book of Acts, that they sold all that they had and contributed it at the feet of the apostles so that distribution could be made. Why? Because there were some that had and there were some that had not. Amen. Mm -hmm. There were some who were struggling. There were some whose basic, most basic needs weren't even met. And they needed uh, the assistance and the help of those who had more, who had an abundance. Well, I'll tell you, Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. He said, you're always going to have the poor with you. Well, if that's true, then obviously the 21st century church is a little off base because we've been told that nobody in the church is supposed to be poor. Nobody in the church is supposed to struggle. I've got news for you, my friend. Struggle and difficulties are part of the Christian walk. That's part of living for God. That's just part of living this life. The Word of God said that God causes His Son to rise on the the just and the unjust. He causes the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. Sinner and saved alike are going to have good days, and sinner and saint alike are going to have bad days. That is just the nature of life. The difference is, if we're a child of God and we're living this thing the way we ought to be living, then through it all, 
We have learned, as the old song says, to trust in Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. We've learned to trust the Lord. And as we trust the Lord, He has promised that He would be there. The Word of God promises that He will supply every need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Supplying every need is not synonymous. I don't care what. Kenneth Copeland says, I don't care what some of these television preachers tell you, that is not synonymous with supplying every want. Mm -hmm. If God supplies my need, he allows me to eat so I don't go hungry. It may be hot dogs, it may not be steak. Amen. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, i personally be happy for the hot dogs. Amen. I don't know about you folks, maybe you've never been hungry. Never, maybe you've never had to go through a period in your life of deep struggle. I mean, really severe struggle. I've been there. I've gone through some periods of time when I was struggling horribly, horribly struggling. I know what it is to be hungry. I'm going to tell you right now. I know what it is not to have a lick of food, not a drop of food, not a crumb in my cabinet, nothing in my refrigerator, not a single thing. And I never turned to stealing, I never turned to begging, you never saw me out on a street corner, you never saw me at a major intersection asking people to put money in a cup. No, I just prayed and spoke to the Lord about it, said, Lord, you've promised you'd meet every need, and I'm just waiting on you. And in the meantime, when I don't have food, then I consider that God calling me to fast. Amen. See, if, if you look at things the right way, if you look at things the way that God would have you to look at things, you can take the most terrible negative of circumstances and make it into something positive. Mm -hmm. When I don't have food... I say, okay, Lord, you must be wanting me to fast. Hello now. You must, you must be wanting me purposefully, for some reason, not to be eating at this time. To lay my flesh aside and to struggle to get my spirit in line with your will. Oh, children, I want you to understand today, the people of Israel were not just fighting... Uh, some war against some issue that is not what was going on the people of israel were in the process of laying claim to what god had called them to they were in the process of laying claim to what the lord had promised them and what god had given them he called them to the land of promise he called them to the land of canaan he promised them a country of their own but there were obstacles in the way I'm going to tell you sometimes God may call you to something the Lord may have something in store for you but that doesn't mean that laying your hands on what God has called you to is altogether easy oh my goodness yep. just because God has called you to something just because God has promised you something doesn't mean that that something is going to come quickly. Listen to me, children. You better hear the preacher now. Doesn't mean it's going to come quickly. Doesn't mean it's going to come easy. But hallelujah to the Lamb of Glory, it's going to come. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Too many people expect God to do things on their timetable. The biggest mistake that I've seen people make throughout the course of my life and my ministry is giving God a timetable. Lord, send me a husband by the time I'm 20. Oh, girl, you just made the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life because the devil knows now that you've set a timetable. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to send every wrong person your way within that time frame, hoping that you'll decide the wrong person is the one that God had for you. But here's the problem. God may have somebody for you, but he doesn't have them for you till you're 25. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, but you've set a timetable. You told the Lord, Lord, do it by the time I'm 20. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I know more believers who have messed up their lives and who have completely uh, wound up in situations that were horrendous, all because they decided they were going to put a timetable on God. Honey, it is not for you to determine when you're going to meet your mate. It is not for you to determine when you're going to own your own home. It is not for you to determine when you're going to buy your first car. It is not for you to, deter to determine when you're going to reach your highest objective in terms of your employment or your career. That timetable is not up to you. You don't lead God, you follow God. Hello now. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You're never going to realize everything that God has for you. You're never going to realize the fullness of God's blessing as long as you're trying to lead God. People of Israel didn't lead God, they followed God. Hallelujah. There was a pillar of fire by day, there was a pillar of a smoke by day, and a pillar of fire by night, but they had to follow. Glory to God. Christian, understand me today. God has called you to follow, not to lead. And then as obstacles come, thank God we have God on our side. And if God has promised us Canaan, then let me tell you a little secret. There ain't nothing in the world standing between you and Canaan that God won't give you the victory concerning. Amen. Hallelujah. If God has promised you Canaan land, then I'm here to tell you you're going to be able to possess Canaan. It doesn't matter how many Jerichos. It doesn't matter how many walled cities exist between here and the promise that God has made to you. If God has promised you that, you can be assured you'll have victory here. The problem is too many of us are not walking in the promise of God because we're not walking in the will of God. If you're not walking in God's will, then honey, you're walking without promise. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I remember when I was 16 years old and the Lord called me. He called me to, uh, to, to Texas. I almost said to Dallas. He called me to Texas. I was 16 years old. I was living at home. Mom and dad paid all the bills. I'd never been out on my own in my life. I didn't know what to do or how to do it, but I knew one thing. I knew God told me that I was to go to Texas. I said, Lord, what on earth for? Why do you want me to go to a place I've never been? I, I had never even visited Texas, didn't know anything about the state of Texas. And I said, Lord, why in the world do you want me at 16 years old to go to Texas? And he told me, he said, you're not ever going to be able to have the Bible school education that you'd like to have. He said, but if you're going to preach this faith, then you need to learn how to live by faith. He said, there's too many preachers running around today that don't know squat about faith. They've never had to live by faith a minute of their life. They've always done it on their own. Everything they did, they did on their own. Everything, every accomplishment they have, they accomplished on their own. There are such a thing as self-made people, folks. There are people out there who are able to achieve and accomplish things for themselves. Certainly there are. But as a child of God, we're supposed to be walking in the will of God. We're supposed to be pursuing the will of God, and we're supposed to be laying hold of God's promise for our life. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And our God does not make promises that He does not intend to keep. That's right. And every obstacle that would stand between the promise of God and the people of Israel and where they stood today, God said, I'll move it. When you get there, you'll get over it. You may have to fight. You may have to struggle. It won't always be easy. There are going to be those battles that go uh, more easily, more swiftly. There are going to be those battles that are much more difficult and troublesome. But in the end, you're going to win. 
and you will progress. You will move forward. Because until you get where I'm leading you, you're not going to stop. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, the story of Jericho is a story about process. There are times when God speaks to us and he, tell, he tells us what He would like for us to do. Sometimes He'll tell us why He'd like us to do it. Sometimes He doesn't. When I asked Him, why do you want me to come to Texas? He said, you're never going to be able to go through Bible school like you'd like to. And I'm and I going to tell you, folks, I did not like hearing that at all. I wanted very much to go to Bible school. There were about three or four times in my life that I was trying to push God into letting me go to various schools that I was interested in going. I wanted to go so bad I could taste it. And the Lord said, you're not going to be able to do this. He said, but if you're going to preach faith like I have uh, said in my mind for you to preach, he said, then you are going to have to learn how to live by faith. Got too many preachers out there preaching stuff. They don't know what they're preaching because they've never lived it. Said, you're going to learn. You're going to live it. You're going to know Until what faith is when you preach faith. And he said, I'm going to prepare you. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He said, I'm going to prepare you for your ministry. So I obeyed the Lord. I bought myself a plane ticket, and I flew down to Fort Worth, Texas, and stayed with my great aunt and uncle and my cousin for a while, eventually getting my own place. And uh, I went through a lot. Tommy, while I was here in Texas as a teenager, I went through some wonderful, wonderful experiences, mm -hmm. and I went through some hellacious, terrible experiences. Mm -hmm. There was one period of time where I was renting a little apartment from a lady, and I rented from her for quite a while. Very nice lady, and she fell very ill with cancer. And the apartment that I lived in was connected to her home on the back of her home. And there was a door between my kitchen and her kitchen. And it was locked, you know, from both sides. We both had locks and were able to lock it so nobody could go one way or the other. And she came to me and she said, Charles, I'm so sorry. I hate to ask you this. She said, but I, I have to ask if it'd be possible for you to move. She said, I am so ill these days. I can't really function very well. She said, I need a nurse, uh, an aide to come and live in your apartment and help care for my house and take care of me and stuff. And well, what was I going to say, you know? Well, I mean, back then I was just working a little cheap job. I didn't make a whole lot of money. I didn't have a whole lot of resources and she needed it pretty quick. So uh, I didn't know what all to do. So I loaded up I'd got myself a little, uh, well, it wasn't a little, it was a huge station wagon, great big old Pontiac station wagon. I loaded up my station wagon with all my stuff, and I went, and I had nowhere to go, had nowhere to stay, didn't have the money to get an apartment, and I lived out of my station wagon for several weeks, and this was in the winter time here in Texas, and you might think, uh, here in Texas. I'm acting like I'm still in time in Florida at the moment, but in Texas. And you might think that in Texas winter doesn't get cold, but it certainly does, especially in the night time. Uh, there are times when the nights get down very, very cold, even to freezing levels. And then the daytime, it might warm up a little bit. It might get even into the 50s, you know, or maybe even the 60s. But there were some cold, cold, cold nights that I was staying there in my car. And I would turn that thing on to run the heat for a little while, you know. And boy, I mean, you could watch the gas needle just go down. Because that thing was so bad on gas. If you think my navigator, if you think a Lincoln navigator is bad on gas, man, you ought to try them old boats that we used to drive years ago. And I would turn it on, and that thing over the course of the night, if I fell asleep, it'd run out of gas. Of course, back then, gas was a whole lot cheaper, so it wasn't quite as hard to, to you know, put enough gas in it to get where you needed to go. But I want to tell you, God told me, I want to train you for your ministry. 
that didn't mean everything was going to be, you know, roses and uh, butterflies. That didn't mean everything was going to be wonderful, that everything was going to go easily and everything was going to go well. But I'll tell you, I went through that experience. I went through the good times. I was able to become part of a church and to come under the tutelage of a minister who to this day continues to be uh, one of the greatest influences I've ever had in my life and in my Christian walk and in my ministry, even though he's gone on to his reward. And I was able to establish that relationship. I was able to become part of a great church. I was able to learn so many things about walking with God, walking by faith, uh, ministry, and ministering as a pastor with Brother Gillum as my uh, tutor, my teacher. So many wonderful things that I gleaned that I had, I would never have gleaned were I to have stayed in my home state of Connecticut. I went through some good times, went through some bad times. There were cities that fell easily. There were cities that didn't fall quite so quickly. But you know what? Every single city I faced, every single obstacle I faced, God gave me the victory in that dilemma. He gave me the victory in that situation. Why? Number one, because I was walking after His will. I was pursuing His promise. Hallelujah. I wasn't out there doing something on my own. I wasn't out there without a promise in hand. I wasn't out there aimlessly trying to do whatever I thought I wanted to do. No, sir. When you are walking in the will of God, when you're doing what you know God would have you to do, then you always are able to go back toward heaven. You're always able to look up toward heaven and say, Lord, I am doing what you've called me to do. I'm not just doing willy-nilly. I'm doing what you've called me to do, what you've asked me to do. And therefore, I know according to the promise of your word that you will meet every need in the process and you will give me victory over every enemy and you will allow me to overcome every obstacle. The story of the fall of Jericho is about process. God told the people of Jericho, of Israel, this is how I want you to fight against Jericho. Now, the methodology that God called them to was not the same methodology He had called them to in previous fights. Folks, i got news for you. God don't always do things the same way. Every circumstance, He is not always going to act. He is not always going to answer in the same exact manner as He did the last time. You're not going to win today's war the way you won yesterday's war. You may not fight today's battle the way you fought yesterday's battle. It's a different battle. You're facing a different enemy. You have different circumstances. This is why it's so imperative that we be listening to the leadership of the Holy Ghost and we be letting God tell us and guide us and give us direction. Victory is ours, but only if we trust God in the process. Hello now. The Lord said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get the people. I want you to put your soldiers up front. I want you to put your priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant. I want them to be carrying trumpets. I want priests carrying trumpets. I want them in the middle. And then I want soldiers at the back of all this. And I want you to march around the city for six days in a row once. Just march around the city once and then go right back to your tents, go to sleep, sleep, and the next day you're going to do it all over again. What? Okay. But on the seventh day, here's what I want you to do. I want you to march around that city not once, but seven times. 
And once you've marched around that city seven times, I want Joshua to give the call. I want the priests on the trumpets to begin to blow their trumpets. I want the people of God to begin to shout with a loud shout. I want you to shout like you've already won, like you've already defeated the enemy, like you're already the victor. Why? Because I've given you that city. Oh, I want to tell you, when God tells you that the city is yours, honey, it's yours. It may still be standing, the walls may still be in front of you, but if God has said, I'm going to give you that city, then you better know that city is yours. One of the things I love about us old-time Pentecostal people, and some of y'all don't understand why we do the way we do, but I'm going to tell you something, uh, you know, why we shout, and why we dance, and why we run the aisles, and why we get happy. I'm going to tell you why we do. Because because there are times when the Holy Ghost speaks to us and says, even though our dilemma is still in front of us, even though our enemy is still facing off with us, even though we haven't yet won the war, the Holy Ghost speaks to our spirit and says, you're the winner, I've given you the victory, the city is yours. <laughs> and all of a sudden in your spirit, you feel the answer has come. I didn't say the answer's coming. I said the answer has come. And in your spirit, you feel the answer has come. And like the people of Israel and the priests with their trumpets, you begin to shout. You begin to rejoice. You begin to get happy in the Holy Ghost because in your spirit, God has spoken. And when God speaks, it's as good as done. And God said, I want you to shout on the seventh day after you've encompassed that city seven times. Why do I want you to shout? Do I want you to shout after the walls come down? Do I want you to shout after I've given you the victory? Do I want you to shout when everything's said and done? Oh, no, 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 no. I want you to shout before anything happens. Why? Because I've already given you the city. In other words, you're supposed to shout by faith. You're supposed to be shouting because God has said it, not because you've seen it happen. Oh, my goodness. See, that's where we Pentecostal people look like a bunch of crazy people to a lot of folks. I'm going to tell you, I remember one time, many years ago, my great uncle, bless his heart, was a raging alcoholic. He had a terrible, terrible problem with alcohol. And he was constantly, you know, being stopped for drunk driving. And th again, this is back in the day before uh, they prosecuted people the way they do now. For drunk driving but he was constantly being stopped and put in jail for drunk driving and all this kind of stuff and he had been through two marriages uh, his kids really had no use for him because he was such a raging alcoholic and bless his heart he was a functioning alcoholic went to work every day never missed a day of work but he just drank himself into a uh, you know, a, a state of mind uh, it, when they come home from work and he'd be miserable and he'd be uh, hard to deal with and, you know, just just not, not very pleasant. And his kids got to the point, <sighs> bless their hearts, where they just really had no use for him anymore. You know, they were just so tired of him and the way he acted. And one day my aunt, my great aunt came to me. We were at Riverside Church Church of God in Fort Worth, Texas, Brother Gillum's church, and one day Aunt Dorothy come over to me and she said, CJ, how about if you and me go up <laughs> and ask Brother Gillum to lay hands on us and pray for us for Eddie. She said, let's pray that God some way, somehow will break that alcoholic bondage on him and somehow, some way, God will allow him to come out of that alcoholism and to be free of his uh, addiction to that substance. So she and I went down to the altar and we asked Brother Gillum to anoint us with all and pray on Eddie's behalf. We were standing in from Uncle Eddie. And Brother Gillum began to pray for us and I'm going to tell you, Aunt Dorothy and I began to pray and all of a sudden we begin to feel the Holy Ghost. We begin to feel the Spirit of the Lord. And all of a sudden, I'm going to tell you, whew, 
I can just feel God telling me it's done. Glory to God, it's taken care of. It is all settled. Now, it had been this way for decades, but nobody had ever done this for him. Nobody had ever gone down. The Bible said where two or three agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done. But here all these years had passed, and nobody had done this on his behalf. But Dorothy and I were doing it that day. And the Holy Ghost come down and spoke to her and I at the same time and said, it is done. I've taken care of it. And I'm going to tell you what, she and I started shouting and dancing all over the front of that church. I'll never forget it because we were holding hands. <laughs> We must have looked like quite a sight. 16, 17-year-old kid and a lady in her at the time. She would have been in her maybe late 50s, you know, early 60s. And I mean, we were just shouting and dancing all over the church. Oh, my God, I'm telling you, God spoke to my spirit. It's done. It's taken care of. Now, Eddie's still up north drunk. He's still up north drinking. He hadn't quit yet. He hadn't been delivered yet. Oh, but we don't have to wait for the walls to come down down because God has given us this city. God has spoken. Ooh, I'm going to tell you, for the believer, especially when you're in tune with the Holy Ghost, you don't need to see it done before you shout. All you need is for God to tell you that it's taken care of. Amen. Glory to God. And I won't tell you the whole story. It's it's long and I don't have time today. It's starting to get a little dark, and, and I need to keep on time. But I want to tell you, folks, my uncle literally, within a few months, had stopped drinking. And it was the weirdest thing, because it basically, a circumstance and a situation arose, and he decided, he made up his mind all of a sudden, after all these years, that he was going to stop drinking. And he was going to try to see if he could not drink for, I believe the time period was either six months or a year. And he went that period of time. Now, here's how God works. I guess I'm going to have to tell you this much anyway. Somebody betting that he could not quit drinking for I think it was either six months or a year, a friend of his bet him. And when those men bet, they bet for real. They weren't joking. And it was a lot of money. He bet them a lot of money. And you have to know my uncle. <laughs> he liked money, okay. Money, you know, that spoke his language. And this man said, Eddie, I'll bet you you couldn't stop drinking for six months or a year, whatever it was. He said, I'll bet you like $5,000 or something like that. And Eddie said, for $5,000, said, I'll take that bet. He said, I'll take that bet. I'll, I'll not drink for six months. Or I, again, I can't remember exactly. It was either six months or a year. Well, my Uncle Eddie said later, he said, here I was trying to win money. He said, I won the bet. I didn't drink that whole time. He said, but by the time I got to the end of that period of time, he said, my mind was so clear I could think. And he said, all of a sudden I realized how much better I felt, how much more energy I had, how I was able to get along better with my ex-wife. I was able to get along better with my girls. I was able to get along better with my family. I was able to get along better with my co-workers. He said, all of a sudden I realized, my God have mercy. He said, if I had realized years and years and years ago how much better being sober would be than being drunk. He said, I'd have quit drinking ages and ages before. That man went to his grave having never touched another drop of alcohol in his life. You could not get my uncle to touch a drink. You could not get Eddie to touch a drink. He said, no. He said, I... I know how good it feels to be sober, he said. And even when people would try to goad him, you know, and they would try to encourage him to have a drink, he said, no. He said, I'm good. I don't want that stuff. He said, I don't need it anymore. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you, folks, it's amazing how God works. It's amazing what God can do. The key to the entire thing is simply this. 
can we trust God through the process? Israel had to trust God through the process of going into the promised land and facing off with one enemy after another, city after another, one army after another. They had to trust God for the victory over and over and over again until they got to their final goal. They had to trust God through the process when it came to uh, facing off with Jericho. God said he wants us to do it this way. He said this is how he wants it done. He wants us marching once around once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. And then he wants us to shout and to blow well, I, the I trumpets. Folks, I'm here to tell you today. We need to trust God in the process. Just because things aren't going so well today, just because you're struggling against an opponent today, an enemy today, and you haven't had to struggle in the past, don't be concerned. God has not given up on you. His promises are not finished. He has not uh, decided differently concerning you. No, no. It's all part of the process. And if we're going to live and walk by faith as God would have us to live and walk by faith we have to trust him in the process hallelujah amen all right